Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Barbara Snyder, president of Case Western Reserve University, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here for the fifth annual Lewis Stokes Leadership Symposium. In particular, I'd like to welcome students attending from Cleveland Heights, East Cleveland, and from the Cleveland School Districts. We are always thrilled to have high school students on our campus, and we know that some of you will be joining us as students at Case Western Reserve someday, I hope in the not too distant future. So we're happy to have you here at our university. As many of you know, Congressman Stokes himself attended public schools in Cleveland, graduated from Central High School, and he went on to attend our university, then called Western Reserve University, and earned his law degree at Cleveland Marshall. Today we are honored to have him back on our campus as a distinguished dis visiting professor at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences. Congressman Stokes spent 30 years in the House of Representatives, where he served on the committee that investigated the Iran-Contra scandal, and also spent several years on the powerful Appropriations Committee. That's the one that decides where our tax dollars go, so it's really important. Throughout his tenure, Congressman Stokes demonstrated deep compassion for the residents of Northeast Ohio, particularly for veterans and those in need of health care. He was also a founding member of the Congressional Black Caucus. Today, I am pleased to tell you that we have, that he's not here today, but we have announced the first recipient of the uh, caucus scholarship, Larry Boyd. And we are very proud of him and look forward to, uh, to having him be an even more important member of our campus community. I'd like to rep recognize another really important member of the Case Western Reserve University family, and that is our wonderful Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. She is also a graduate of Cleveland Schools and a two time graduate of Case Western Reserve University. Eight years ago, she took on the rather daunting task of following Congressman Stokes as our representative in the 11th District, and she has served with distinction, starting with her first bill aimed at better protecting children from abuse and neglect, to a more recent measure that seeks to reduce predatory lending, both very important things for our country and our community. She now chairs the House Ethics Committee and serves on the powerful Ways and Means Committee that's the one responsible for writing tax bills and overseeing things like Social Security and Medicare, important to all of us. Congresswoman Jones was kind enough to speak at my investiture here at Severance Hall, and I am so pleased to have her back on our campus today. As a current colleague of Congresswoman Waters, she'd like to share a few thoughts with us, and I'd like to invite her up to do that right now. To President Snyder, my predecessor to Honorable Congressman Lewis Stokes, my colleague and good friend with much more seniority than me, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Seniority matters in Congress, just in case you didn't know that. Uh, to her husband, Ambassador Williams, uh, and all of you, good evening and welcome to my alma mater. I promise these will be a few words, but it is so wonderful to have a colleague like Maxine Waters in the House. Not only in our House, but in the House of Representatives. Um, when I first came to Congress, I served on financial services, and Congresswoman Waters was on the Housing Subcommittee, and I managed to wiggle my way onto that committee, and boy, was I glad I was there, because I got to learn from a master. And today, she is now the chair of that committee, the Housing Subcommittee of Financial Services. And that is a significant thing for people across America. And uh, Congresswoman Waters, I wanted you to know that because you're on that committee, and we've been working hard on housing issues in Cuyahoga County, I invited the realtors to join us this evening. And there are several of them here, so stand up and so you can wave at her. She knows that you all are in the house. Uh, as well as a, lo a lot of other people. But my time is short because I just wanted to say welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much, Congresswoman. It is really always great to have you here on our campus. Um, before I close, two final matters. One is just to let you know the format of today's program. 
Congressman Stokes is going to introduce Congresswoman Waters, and she will offer her remarks. Then two of our faculty members, Mark Joseph from the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences and Karen Beckwith from the Department of Political Science, will offer brief responses. And then you in the audience will have an opportunity to ask questions and participate in the dialogue. So that's the format for, uh, for the program. My other task is a lot of fun. I get to introduce uh, Ambassador Sidney Williams, who is sitting right here. He has a couple of claims to fame. He is Congresswoman Waters' husband. Actually, multiple claims to fame. He is married to Congresswoman Waters. He is an ambassador and appointee of the Clinton administration. Ambassador to the Bahamas, yes? And he also, for those of you who might be football fans in the audience, he played football for the Cleveland Browns in the 1960s. <laughs> And he was on the team in 1964, the, year, the last year the team won its NFL title. <laughs> so Ambassador Williams, thank you for being here. You couldn't have come at a better time. We have great hopes for the Browns. <laughs> hoping they're going to live up to the, to the legacy that you left. So uh, we're, we're all still hoping for that. So thank you for being here this evening. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Congressman and Case Western Reserve University graduate and faculty member, the Honorable Lewis Stokes. Thank you. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much, um, President Barbara Snyder. It is certainly an honor to have the president of this great educational institution introduce me on this occasion. I appreciate your very kind and overly generous words of introduction. But I also appreciate very much the strong support that you have given this symposium. And it's an honor to be here on this occasion with you. I also want to thank uh, Cleve Gilmore, the Dean of the Mandel School, where I have the honor of being part of the faculty for your strong support for this symposium. From its initial stages, you've understood the significance of bringing these outstanding national leaders to the campus of Case Western Reserve University. Your collaboration, along with that of President Snyder and her predecessors, has kept this symposium as a priority at our institution. Also, I want to thank Adrian Ziak and her Office of Governmental Relations for all their work in making this evening possible. It takes a lot of work to bring an evening of this sort together and a lot of work with the Congressperson's Office as well as the University and I want to thank her for all of that work. I also want to add my uh, welcome to that of the president to uh, Ambassador Sid Williams. Uh, Ambassador Williams, uh, we really hope that you, uh, your presence here tonight uh, results in the same results of 64. <laughs> sure, you're bringing us good luck because it looks like uh, the Browns have once again uh, on the move. It was an honor to have him here. Uh, he did uh, uh, a great stint of representation of this nation uh, as our ambassador to the Bahamas and, uh, as I said, as an old friend. Happy to have you here, Sid. Uh, a few moments ago, we heard the remarks of Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. Um, and I don't think there's anyone in Cleveland who is not aware of the great pride that I take in her being my successor in Congress. As she stood on our stage tonight, all of us present had to be proud of this Congresswoman who graduated from both Case Western Reserve University's undergraduate school as well as its law school. Uh, Stephanie Tubbs Jones epitomizes the success of Case graduates. She's an example of where Case's students of today can be tomorrow. Let's give her a great big hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
As one of the 13 members of Congress who founded the Congressional Black Caucus, I wanted to have the students at this university see and hear the extraordinary men and women who comprise this historic institution in the United States Congress. The highlight of my 30 years in Congress was to serve with these men and women with the knowledge that there's a very special bond between us because of the unique place that each of us holds in American history. We began these symposiums with John Lewis, an American treasure and a civil rights icon, followed by John Conyers, today the first black to ever chair the House Judiciary Committee. Next was Charlie Rangel, today the first black member of Congress to ever chair the powerful Ways and Means Committee of the House. He was followed by Mel Watt of North Carolina, a Yale Law School graduate and chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus at that time. Tonight, I'm proud to bring you the first female member of the caucus to keynote this symposium. She is often described as one of the most powerful women in American politics today. For those of you who are students in the Mandel School, when your professors talk about advocacy for the poor, the underserved, for minorities, for women, children, and the voiceless, Maxine Waters is the epitome of advocacy. She is fearless and outspoken. She is much like Shirley Chisholm, the first black woman in Congress who described herself as being unbought and unbossed. Maxine Waters came from humble beginnings, being the fifth of 13 children reared by a single mother. At the age of 13, she began working in St. Louis, Missouri in factories and segregated restaurants. Later, she moved to Los Angeles, worked in garment factories and at the telephone company. She earned a bachelor's degree at the California State University at Los Angeles. She began her career in public service as a teacher and a volunteer coordinator in the Head Start program. She has a strong background in social work. In January, Ms. Waters will begin her 18th year in the United States Congress. In 1997 and 1998, she was chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. While she led us on many fronts, one of the areas where she and I collaborated was in getting additional funding for black community groups involved in HIV AIDS. She had assigned me the responsibility to negotiate with the Clinton administration on behalf of these groups. Now I had gotten them in the negotiations to agree to $110 million and was trying to get a staff to go to $125 million. They adamantly turned me down, refusing to go past $110 million. Finally, in total frustration, I told them, OK, I tried to be nice. <laughs> now deal with Congresswoman Waters. <laughs> I called her, told her what had happened, and she took over the negotiations. Two hours later, they had agreed to $155 million. <laughs> And they were glad to get out of the room. <laughs> she is tough. She fights for the causes she believes in. She is currently the chief deputy whip of the Democratic Party and is co-chair of the powerful House Democratic Steering Committee. As you heard earlier, she currently sits on the Financial Services Committee, where she chairs the subcommittee on housing and community opportunity, which our congressperson told us. Another area in which she sought funding while I served on the Appropriations Committee was a program that she founded in Los Angeles for young people known as Project Build. The program helped these young people 
and housing developments and job training and placements. She has spent her life fighting for people and causes. I've sat on the floor of the Congress many days and admired her for her eloquence as she spoke on behalf of the poor, economic development, equal justice, and human rights. She was a leader in the battle to end apartheid in South Africa and is a leader to stop genocide in Darfur. And in that respect, I certainly commend our president, Barbara Snyder, our board of trustees of this university, and the great leadership by the students and the professors at the MSAS School of Applied Social Sciences for the divestment which this university has now agreed to in terms of any funding this university has relevant to business in Darfur. That's good. The lady whom I bring to you tonight has also fought to free poor countries from the burden of international debt. We're fortunate to have with us tonight a lady whom I'm proud to call my friend. She is a great lady. She's been a leader and a fighter for minorities, the poor, and the voiceless in our society. Whenever she speaks, whether on the floor of the Congress, or on the campus at Case Western Reserve University. She is respected as a leader. She came all the way from Los Angeles, California to be with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give Congresswoman Maxine Waters a warm Cleveland reception. Good evening. To President Snyder, I'd like to congratulate you on your recent appointment here at Case Western Reserve, and I'd like to thank you for the support that you're already giving uh, to the Lou Stokes Symposium. And I'd like to thank you also for the support that you're giving to the scholarship program. I wish you great success here at this great university and I think that as a woman, I must say, I'm pleased and proud uh, to be here this evening with the first woman president of Case Western Reserve University. Thank you. <laughs> to my dear friend, Louis Stokes. Louis Stokes is a gentleman's gentleman. He was a wonderful legislator, one of the best public policy makers I've ever known. I respect him so much and hold him in such high esteem that when he asked me to come, I didn't have to think about it a second time. I said, certainly I will come to your leadership symposium, but if Lou Stokes asked any member of Congress to come to Case Western, that member would come because of him, what he stands for, his contributions that he's made to the Congress of the United States and to this nation. And I thank you for inviting me this evening, Lou. Would you give him a big round of applause? <laughs> Louis Stokes could not have chosen or supported a better person to step into his shoes. Stephanie Tubbs Jones has done a marvelous job in the Congress of the United States of America. She has taken up the position representing her district, not only on the issues that Lewis was involved in, but she has expanded on those issues. And because of that, she now chairs the Ethics Committee of the Congress of the United States. This is a daunting task trying to keep us all in line. In addition to that, 
She serves on the Ways and Means Committee, where she is involved in all of the tax issues and so many other issues. You should be proud that she is representing you here in Cleveland. A big round of applause for Stephanie Tubbs Jones. When I was invited to be here this evening, I asked my husband if he would accompany me on this trip. He didn't have to think twice uh, because he lived in Cleveland and I have heard ever since I've been married to him how great he was <laughs> from him. <laughs> serving as a linebacker for the Cleveland Browns. So on the way here, he had to tell me about every street that he had ever walked on. <laughs> he had to remind me about all of the friends, many of whom I've met since I've been married to him. And of course, he had to tell me that not only did he know Lou Stokes, he knew when his brother was first elected mayor in the city of Cleveland. <laughs> and he told me, and don't you forget it, this is my hometown. <laughs> So I'm delighted that he was able to accompany me here this evening. And I want you to know, just in the short time that I've been here, I have a feel for this university and what you're doing. And I'm so pleased that you had the good sense, the vision, and the wisdom to ask Congressman Stokes to join you on this faculty. I know that he has already made a great contribution, and he will continue to do so. When I was asked to come here this evening, I thought about a lot of topics uh, that I could talk with you about. And certainly, uh, recognizing that we are in a housing disaster in the United States with a real meltdown going on with foreclosures, I thought about talking about predatory lending and the foreclosure problem because I know that it is a problem here in this area. I also thought about talking about housing because I am the chair of the subcommittee on housing and community opportunity and I thought I could talk about other issues related to housing. The HOPE 6 program, the Section 8 program, all of those programs that are under my jurisdiction. I thought too that I might want to talk about Gina 6 uh, because I've been involved with this very troublesome case out of Gina, Louisiana, uh, where there was the hanging of a noose, and the nooses have been showing up all over America. And then again, I thought about talking about genocide, as I thought about what we had done in dismantling apartheid in South Africa, and what we need to do to get rid of genocide in Darfur. And while I thought about all these things, including some of the issues that the presidential candidates are talking about on the campaign trail, particularly universal health care and others, I decided I would not talk about any of those. I decided I would talk about an issue that I have been spending a, an extraordinary amount of time on in the Congress of the United States recently, and that is the war in Iraq. I decided to talk about the war in Iraq because it dawned on me some time ago uh, that it does not make good sense to talk about the future if you don't understand that if there's not peace in the world, there is no future for any of us. It does not make good sense to talk about where we want to be a few years from now with universal health care if we don't have the money that we need in order to institute universal health care. When your dollars, the taxpayer dollars, are going out uh, to support a war in Iraq where there's no end in sight, uh, we will never have universal health care. We will never have the money to invest in education and correct the ills of leave no child behind. We will never have the money to invest in the human potential of the citizens of this country if we continue to spend billions of dollars on a war in Iraq, a war that we should never have gotten in in the first place. And so, this symposium is about leadership. And we need to focus on 
leadership or the lack of as we try and deal with what I think is the most important issue confronting our country today, and again, that is the war in Iraq. The discussion on leadership could not be timelier. In just over a month, the primary season will begin in Iowa, and that will begin the selection for the next president of the United States, perhaps the most important leadership position that has ever been known in this world. But the leader, the election for the leader of the United States will be shaped by the leadership of ordinary citizens all across the country. Elections are decided by the will of the voters. And today, I'm really here to engage you and to urge you to harness the extraordinary power contained within university students to make your mark on this country and to make some positive change in this world. Today, I'd like to suggest that I feel that this single most important issue is getting sidestepped, sidetracked. As you know, you've heard a lot about Iraq. You heard that there were no weapons of mass destruction. You heard that the President of the United States stopped the inspections going into Iraq. He was anxious to get into Iraq to prove that he was going to save us all from Saddam Hussein, that he was going to get rid of terrorism, and as some people would suggest, he was going to take over the oil in the oil fields of Iraq. But despite the polls and all of the information that you have learned about this war in Iraq, despite all of this, we're, we're deadlocked in the Congress of the United States, and we cannot get legislation that will help to wind us out of Iraq. We have had several attempts to do this. We have had votes, particularly on my side of the aisle, that would target a deadline date by which we should be out of Iraq. Yet, we continue to spend billions with no end in sight. The President of the United States just requested from us another $200 billion for the war in Iraq. We attempted legislation recently to say, Mr. President, we will vote $50 billion and a deadline date. We will fund getting out of Iraq. We will not fund the $200 billion that you're asking for. We passed that legislation out of the House and it failed on the Senate side. They cannot get legislation moving, despite the polls, where most Americans believe we should be out of Iraq, that it has been mismanaged, and that we should not continue to occupy Iraq. Well, it's been over five years since Congress authorized President Bush's war in Iraq. At the time, who would have thought we were being led into perhaps the worst foreign policy disaster in American history. Well, I certainly had a pretty good idea, I and some others, when we urged colleagues to oppose the authorization for war on October 7th of 2002. Many of us voted against the war authorization in the first place, and many more members wish they had voted against it. In the post-September 11th environment, Many of the leaders in our community in Congress and the media were just reeling from the attacks on our homeland. And they were willing to buy whatever the administration was selling about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and of course, Saddam Hussein. After nearly five years of broken promises and misdirection on the progress of the war in Iraq, 3,876 of our brave men and women have perished, and the war has cost the United States at least a trillion dollars in direct and indirect spending. The social and physical infrastructure of Iraq has been decimated over the past five years as over four million Iraqi refugees have fled their homes and perhaps hundreds of thousands more have been killed as a result of our war. We will all now admit that we were carried into war on lies and that five years of military involvement in Iraq 
has been horribly mismanaged, but lately there's been a lot of talk on how the situation in Iraq is improving and that the surge is working. I take strong issue with this, and I'm worried that this country is again being duped or being misguided uh, by the leadership in the White House. We are again being misled into staying in Iraq. The war in Iraq is the defining issue of the 21st century, and we must demand uh, that our leadership, especially the presidential candidates, honestly confront the problems of Iraq and cease to hide behind empty rhetoric. The decrease in violence in Iraq, although welcome, is a deceptive statistic to use in measuring the progress of this administration's war in Iraq. Americans continue to die every day in Iraq. In fact, over 900 U.S. troops have been killed in Iraq since the surge began, making 2007 the deadliest year yet in Iraq. The decrease of violence also reflects a horrible reality. Five years of civil war has accomplished much of the goals of ethnic cleansing among the warring sects. There are scarcely any mixed neighborhoods left in Iraq. Various factions within the Sunni, the Shia, and the Kurdish leadership are still engaged in a violent struggle for power of their country. And there have been no signs whatsoever that the Iraqi government is interested in making the political compromises necessary to quell the violence in Iraq. If, as the administration insisted, the military surge in Iraq was intended to create space for political reconciliation, they have miserably failed. In fact, political reconciliation may be impossible while the United States military remains in occupation of Iraq. What incentives do the leaders of Iraq have to make tough political compromises if the American military has promised to keep them safe and securely in power? President Bush and his military planners were ignorant of the problems of the power vacuum and created by the overthrow of Saddam Hussein's government. They didn't know that we would create this vacuum. The president still has not provided the nation with a plan for success in Iraq and cannot describe what success even looks like. Suggestions by our leaders to the otherwise are best ill-informed and worse blatant lies. A study just released that suggests that the war in Iraq has already cost us $1.6 trillion in direct and indirect spending. Not millions, not billions, but trillions. If you were the leader of this country, imagine how you could have otherwise spent that money. Those of us opposed to this war have not only made the point that we were led into this war based on lies and misinformation, but that we're using precious resources that could be dedicated to health care, affordable housing, repairing our infrastructure, and protecting the homeland. The incredible resources that are being dedicated to Iraq, both money and manpower, would be better spent at making America stronger. We each have our own ideas and priorities, and it is our responsibility to make informed judgments about our prospective leaders. But civic participation is not a spectator sport. You must be active in demanding what you want as a citizen. You must become a leader in your own right. During Vietnam, it really wasn't the politicians who changed the tide of war. It was the students who took the reins of leadership. Students marched in protest, held sit-ins, letter writing campaigns, and more. When four students were killed and nine more injured, just a short drive north of here at Kent State during a protest of the Nixon administration's policies in Vietnam, it was your leadership that led eight million students across the country to shut down schools and protest of depraved government policies. The leadership of us in Congress would be worth little without the support and efforts of people like you. Most of the greatest changes in the history of this country have come from grassroots students, teachers, and community activists, not even from policymakers in DC. 
We need to recapture the spirit of protest by the students that finally ended the Vietnam War. We need to recapture the efforts that forced an end to apartheid in South Africa. We need to recapture the righteous energy of the civil rights movement right here in the United States. Perhaps one of you is the next Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King, or Nelson Mandela. This country is in desperate need of that type of energy from our students. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to end the war in Iraq. We must bring our troops home to their families as soon as possible. Refocus this country's resources on the issues that matter the most to the American people and give back to the Iraqis responsibility for their own country. It is vital that we elect a president that understands that responsibility. As chairwoman and co-founder of the Out of Iraq Congressional Caucus, I can promise you that I will fight every single day against this administration's misguided policies. I hope uh, that this nation can count on you as students in this audience and students on this campus to do the same. But I also hope that you can see within yourselves the strength and determination to become the next great leaders of our society. I want to thank you for inviting me here to Case Western Reserve. I'm delighted to be here with my colleague, with my former colleague, with the new president, with the faculty, with my husband, and all of you. I want you to know that I believe in America. I believe that we can make even greater progress. I believe in the promise of America. There are many nights that I go to bed disgusted and wondering, what am I doing in Congress? What is happening uh, to the voice of the people in this nation? And I go to bed somewhat disgusted. But after a nice night's sleep, I wake up the next morning knowing that if we fight, we can win. If we struggle, we can maintain the promise of America. Not only do I believe in America and America's promise, I believe that we all have a role to play in it. The president may have started this war, but the people can end this war. I am not satisfied uh, that as recently as yesterday, we got new information that the information about the injuries was being withheld from us. We know that 3,869 or so are dead. We also thought that we had about 28,451 U.S. troops that had been seriously wounded. But little did we know there was another 20,000 with brain injuries that we have not been told about. In our district offices, we get calls every day from veterans who have served in Vietnam, some who have served in World War II, who were in Desert Storm, and now coming back from Iraq. They don't have the medical care oftentimes that they were promised. You heard the story of Walter Reed Hospital and how it was discovered that it was in disrepair and the veterans were not getting the services that they had been promised if they would make the sacrifice. Well, these veterans are calling us every day. Many of them are homeless. Families were broken up when they made the sacrifice and went to war because their president made the call. Many of them were just patriotic and they wanted to defend their country. Others went because they didn't have jobs. They didn't have a future. And so they went to serve. Little did they know that they may come home as a veteran and not have available to them all of the services that had been promised. And so increasingly, we're getting returning veterans from Iraq who are joining in the coalition to end the war. I wanted to say that to you this evening, not only because I believe firmly that we must end this war and redirect the resources, but I wanted to say that to you because as a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, it is oftentimes felt that we are confined to certain issues, 
that we're only concerned about certain issues. Even the press simply calls us on certain issues. But for me and the rest of the members uh, to take the leadership on getting us out of Iraq is another indication that we bring to the, con to, uh, the caucus, to the Congress of the United States, a kind of leadership that's not often recognized. We are there not only on issues of the African-American community, on minority communities, on poor communities. We were elected to help make public policy for this entire country. We're involved in domestic issues and international issues. We are leaders in foreign affairs. We are leaders on issues that oftentimes do not get the press attention. But it's because of us that we keep our caucus the Democratic Caucus focused on coming up with legislation to attempt to get us out of Iraq. We will not be silent. We will not be quiet. We will not take a back seat because we think somehow the president may veto it. We're saying to our leadership, we want to come up with legislation every day of the week. We want to keep trying to send it to him and put it on his desk. If he has the power, as he does, to veto it, let him do it, but let it keep coming until he's no longer there and we elect a president <laughs> who will honor our request. And so to the young people of Case Western University, I want you to know there are no limits to your possibilities. You cannot be boxed in to narrow professions you cannot be boxed in, boxed in uh, to have people think, or have you think, that you can only go certain places and do certain things and accomplish so much. You can do whatever you want to do. You can do whatever your talent dictates. You can do whatever you put your mind to. And I'm hopeful that you will emerge as leaders on the national and international stage. I'm hopeful that you will carry with your leadership a belief that there can be peace on earth, that we can live on this earth in harmony with other cultures, with other ideas. I'm hoping that you do that because it is only with that kind of leadership will we be able to put our talent and our ideas to work for our own country so that we can have universal health care, we can have quality education, we can have better housing, we can have a country that lives up to its promise. Thank you very much. We have had some giants here on the stage, and uh, it is truly humbling to be up here, but really a thrill to be, have been asked to be a part of this event. Uh, Congressman Tubbs Jones and Congressman Stokes. Congressman Waters, I know this will be a lifelong honor to have been able to share this dialogue with you. So I thank you for the opportunity. I have to give a quick personal note before I give my reactions. Uh, my wife, Melani, is here tonight. She's actually in the back row there, uh, trying to keep our three little ones under control. They're being very good so far. And Melani is a California girl. And so when we met in graduate school uh, about 15 years ago, I remember one evening the conversation turned to role models and who were the leaders that we looked up to, who were people that we look to to help us define our own career path. And I remember Congresswoman, she mentioned one person, and that was you. <laughs> and when she did that, I thought, oh man, I've got a serious lady here. <laughs> I guess you could say she played the Maxine Waters card. <clears throat> but it worked out, we're married, three little ones. I'm going to pick up and build on this, this topic of the war in Iraq and, and try to link it to the subject of leadership uh, more explicitly. Um, the war in Iraq has really been a demonstration, I think, of leadership at its very worst. Part of the reason why we all speak with so much pride about the leadership giants who are with us today is because of the way with integrity they appeal to the better sides of ourselves. 
And I think what we see demonstrated in the war in Iraq is leadership that appeals to the worst side of ourselves. And I want to focus just for a couple minutes, and I know you all have lots of questions, so Professor Beckwith and I are going to be brief and get out of the way. Um, but I want to focus on just two of these harmful motivations that we have that I believe the leadership of our country has appealed to in this war in Iraq, but I think this is emblematic of leadership that we see not only in politics, but in the corporate sector, uh, often, too often in our communities. Again, leadership that appeals not to our better sides, but to our worst sides. And the two harmful motivations that we see more and more used in leadership are fear and greed. Fear and greed. Dr. King said this about fear. He said, normal fear protects us, but abnormal fear paralyzes us. Normal fear motivates us to improve our individual and collective welfare. Abnormal fear constantly poisons and distorts our inner lives. Our problem is not to be rid of fear, but rather to harness it and master it. And I think the point here is it's not that there aren't things to be afraid of, whether internationally or right here in our own communities, but do we allow th that to drive our policy making and our decisions? Where will we find leadership in today's global society, diverse nation that we share, that doesn't highlight fears about differences we have among each other, but instead highlights our commonalities? Where will we find leadership that unites as opposed to divides? It almost seems unfair. It's too easy to divide us, right? As human beings, we're actually pretty good at that ourselves, right? Separating ourselves into groups, judging people by how they're different from us. It seems to me what we need is leadership that doesn't take advantage of that and exploit it, but instead is keenly attuned to our commonalities and works overtime to tell us what we share rather than what divides us. And whether we're talking about Iraq and the rest of the world, whether we're talking about Muslims and Christians, or whether we're talking about blacks, whites, Latinos, Asians, whether we're talking about rival gangs, how can we focus on our commonalities rather than our differences? It seems to me that's the kind of leadership who we have with us here tonight, and that's the kind of leadership that's far too often lacking in our society. Let me say a quick word about a second harmful motivation, and that's greed. Gandhi said about greed, he said, there's a sufficiency in the world for man's needs, but not for man's greed. We'll never have enough. If we're driven by a quest for more, and you all are well aware, and this is that time of year, right? Our consumerist, materialistic society, what more? My wife and I are dealing with our kids already making out their Christmas lists. Right? What more can we have? And we're looking at all the toys that they already have. How do we have leadership that helps us focus not on what we don't have, not on what those who have more than us have and how we get there, but as Congresswoman Waters has done throughout her career, those who have less than we do. It seems to me far too often we're looking at those on the side of the fence with more than those who don't. And so the key here, it seems, is leadership that models moderation. How much is enough? And models a perspective that says, focus on those with less, not those with more. I thought it was very interesting. Bill Gates, one of the great entrepreneurs in our society, took the occasion of his talk, commencement talk at Harvard to introduce this term creative capitalism. Some of you may have heard about it. But his notion that how do we harness our entrepreneurial spirit. It's not, there's nothing wrong with being an entrepreneur, right? That's what makes our country great. But how do we harness that in a way that expands the market to include more and uses the best of the market and innovation to help meet the needs of people? I want to say one quick last thing on a subject I know is near and dear to the Congresswoman's heart, and she probably considered it as a possible topic for tonight, and that's young people. And that's engaging young people. And we've got a great core of high schoolers here with us tonight. Thank you. 
where do we find the kind of leadership that engages our young people, that doesn't make them feel like they are objects in society, we're waiting for them to grow up and get to the point where they can be adult like us, but right where they are now, that they have a value and a perspective and something to add. As Congresswoman Waters said, there are no limits to their possibilities. Where do we have a leadership that can make that point clear, especially to young people of color? And I want to conclude by linking this back to her original point, namely, the war in Iraq takes away from so many other things we could be doing and investing in, particularly around our young people. So one idea, and I'll sneak a question in here, was about how we think about creative ways to engage young people in public service. And I wondered what you thought of perhaps some kind of mandatory policy that young people are asked to serve in public service, to volunteer for a period of time during their youth. But the difficulty right now is there is something called the Universal Service Act in Congress, but really it's wrapped up around this political hot potato of re-implementing the draft. So it's become conflated with this political challenge of having all of us realize that while we're sitting here safe and warm, there are families with folks over fighting for us. So that issue has become linked to this issue that I would like to see also discussed, which is how, what might we do policy-wise to support young people getting involved in public service? So perhaps we might touch on that in the q and I'll end there. Thank you very much. Good evening. The first response I want to make to Congresswoman Waters is simply to say, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> and I suppose the second thing I need to say is don't get me started. <laughs> um, but I would like to start actually by um, thanking Lewis Stokes, and I want to say that I met Lewis Stokes more than 15 years ago when I was a professor at the College of Worcester. Now, I know he doesn't remember it because I asked him and he didn't remember. Um, but I, like so many who have met the congressman, um, never forgot. I had the pleasure of introducing Congressman Stokes to a large audience like this, and believe me, I brought my children too. Congressman Stokes was speaking on civil liberties and civil rights in the context of what he had hoped would be the 1990 Civil Rights Act. Um, George Herbert Walker Bush was president at the time, and Congressman Stokes and others had carefully crafted civil rights legislation, legislation that would have been, in the words of the New York Times, the most comprehensive civil rights legislation since the Voting Act of 1965. This legislation in 1990 had been carefully negotiated with President Bush and his staff, only to be defeated by President Bush's somewhat surprising veto of the legislation. Um, as usual that night, Congressman Stokes gave a masterful presentation, and he generously stayed late in the student center, talking with students and taking questions. Now, I also want to note something else about Congressman Stokes and to place it in the context of the political science literature on women in politics. So those of you who know me will know that I'm now entering my fondest arena. Um, as Congressman Stokes prepared to leave Congress, so I heard this story, he also helped to prepare an outstanding and talented, already highly successful political woman to compete to replace him. That woman is now Congressman Stephanie Tubbs Jones. And um, I would be remiss as the Floristone Mather professor not to mention that Congressman Tubbs Jones is an alumna of Case Western Reserve University's Floristone Mather College for Women and, of course, as we've said, of our law school. Um, I want to underscore in her success how unusual, generous, and impressive it is to see the kind of encouragement and support that Congressman Stokes gave to now Congressman Congresswoman Tubbs Jones. Now I'll get back to the political science here because recent research on women's access to elective office, including to Congress, indicates that intentional recruitment and encouragement of talented women is key to promoting their candidacies and to ensuring their election. I suspect that Congressman Stokes is one of only a very few members of Congress who have encouraged and nurtured a woman of color into a congressional career. 
numbers of women in Congress are still very low. In 1978, not even 30 years um, ago, women constituted less than 4% of all members of Congress. It wasn't until 1992, the so-called year, uh, year of the woman, that women actually made it into double digits. 10.8% of, of members of Congress were women after the 1992 elections. Increases since that time have been steady but modest, and mostly attributable to the election of Democratic women to the House. In the current Congress, 16 women sit in the Senate, 16%. 71 women serve in the U.S. House, 16.3%. Now, what happens, I have some opinions on this. What happens when we consider race as well as sex? Not only are there few women in the U.S. Congress, but women of color are underrepresented. First, there are no women of color in the U.S. Senate. And so this ends my discussion of the Senate for the evening. <laughs> in the U.S. House, 21 women of color constitute 4.8 of all representatives, but they constitute almost 30% of all the women in the House. Most of those women of color are from California. Ten of them are half of all women of color in the U.S. House, and all of them are Democrats. This is a problem when we do research on women in Congress because they're all from California, they're all Democrats, and they're mostly women of color, which makes for some great policy outcomes. Now, there are many factors that um, affect the numbers of women in the U.S. Congress, and I will be brief because I know you want to hear the Congresswoman. Our pattern in the United States of self-nominating, self-financing primary campaigns in conjunction with a high incumbency re-election rate, which means primarily the re-election of men, and structured by a single-member plurality electoral system, the least pro propitious for female candidates, produces a pattern of few female candidates and hence few elected women. Now let me make clear what I mean by few elected women. In a nation of more than 150 million women, equitable, equitable representation would be proportional to women's presence in the general population, 51%. So we would anticipate maybe 222 women in the U.S. House, 51% of all representatives, and 51 women in the Senate. So we're about 151 women short in the House and 35 women short in the Senate. Focusing specifically on African-American women, now not just women of color, but specifically African-American women, we find that there, again, are no African-American women in the U.S. Senate or any woman of color. I can't leave that alone. Um, but only 12%, um, excuse me, only 12 African-American women um, African American women in the House, 2.8 percent. African American women, however, constitute 6.7 percent of all U.S. citizens and therefore should constitute a little under 7 percent of all House members. So we should have about 29 African American women, not Latinas, not women who are Asian Americans, but we should have about 7 percent, 29 seats in the House and between six and seven members of the Senate. Now, if this seems too visionary and too ambitious, um, let me contrast what it means to have few elected women in the United States against what we know about elected women in other nations. According to the Interparliamentary Union, Rwanda leads worldwide among nations with the highest percentage of women in the lower house. In, Ru in the Rwandan lower house in their parliament, 48.8% of seats are held by women. Rwanda was followed by Sweden with 47.3%. 165 women sit in the Swedish Riksdag. Finland, Costa Rica, Norway, Denmark, all have more than 35%. Um, the United States holds 68th place among nations with our 16.3% of women in the lower house. That ranks us just below Zimbabwe, not the best nation with a democratic record. Panama and El Salvador, they are tied for 67th place. And because the 68th place ranking doesn't take into account ties, that means 83 nations have a better record of electing women just last year than the United States. Now, why is this? Why do other nations have such high representation of women in their legislatures? There are lots of reasons, and I've already mentioned some. But one important difference is the active recruitment of young women to office. The difference in candidacies between women and men is not in qualification, it is not in levels of ambition, it is not in levels of political interest, political engagement, or political participation. It's not even in levels of campaign financing. To, to return to Congressman Stokes, one of the factors that makes a difference is recruitment. 
early notice to girls, especially by family members, that they would make good elected officials, encouragement to girls that they should think about running for office. Recent research indicates that recruitment makes a difference. Men are recruited too and encouraged to consider themselves for candidacies. Women are not. Men are more likely than women to have been recruited by political elites who make a difference, party officials and elected government officials. In short, we in the United States can do better, we should do better, in electing women to high office. And we can do so by following the example of Congressman Stokes. When it comes to leadership, here's one thing we can do right now. The encouragement to run for office has to start early, as early as grade school or high school. And so to those of you young women in the audience, um, I want to say that you can be whatever you want. I quite agree with Congresswoman Waters. But you should be now thinking about running for office. I encourage you to think of yourselves. I encourage you to think of yourselves as possible U.S. representatives, senators, and presidents where Congressman Stokes once served, and where our current representative, Stephanie Tubbs-Jones, and our speaker, Maxine Waters, now sit. So could you. And now I'll ask my department chair, Joe White, to join me at the podium to begin to monitor, I think, some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Beckwith. Thank you, Professor Joseph. Thank you, especially Representative Waters and Representative Stokes and everybody who's been involved in putting this event together. For political scientists, this is like being a kid in the candy store. And so I would just like to express my appreciation to both Congressman Stokes and the university leadership, President Snyder, for making this happen because uh, we get to meet people and see people and have events that we wouldn't otherwise get to do. And it's just fun for us. It may be, it's, it's an honor to participate, but it's also just fun. So thank you. Um, the way this is going to work is there are people with microphones. And so if you'd like to ask a question, you should raise your hand and the people with microphones will go try to find you. You'll need to move to the side so they can actually bring the microphone to you. And while this is being worked out, um, I, I said I would ask a question myself first, but uh, Professor Joseph already has. So I would like to uh, uh, give uh, Congresswoman Waters a chance to respond to the question about mandatory national service. When you listen to certain members of Congress uh, talk about important um, periods of their lives, you will hear them talk about their service in the Peace Corps. Not only do they um, give that service um, great credit for helping them to become the person that they have become, uh, but it gave them, the op gave them the opportunity to see other parts of the world, to work with other people, to work with other cultures, uh, to learn and to grow. And I've always listened uh, with great interest because I've never yet met a person who served in the Peace Corps that had one bad thing to say about that service. It really was significant. And so just uh, my experiences in talking with um, members of Congress and others that I've known who've served, I've come to know, believe, and understand that it is important to be in public service, uh, to volunteer, to be a part of a program uh, where you're giving and you're doing and you're learning. And I'm not the only one. Many members of Congress support uh, public service. As a matter of fact, it is one of the ideas that uh, Hillary Clinton has put forth in her presidential campaign. Uh, it is something that she feels strongly about. And I do believe uh, that it should be a part of our uh, government, our public policy, uh, to offer the opportunity to young people to serve and to reward them for serving. Uh, I have not come to grips with whether or not you should mandate it. Um, I think that it is important to have it available, to offer it, to make it meaningful. And um, I think we continue to, to look at ways to do it. 
and do it right. There are some people who think that, that people should, should not pay taxes so as not to fund the, the war in Iraq. And, the, and there are still other people who think that Congress should just simply not present a bill um, and, and put it on Bush's desk for, for, for an, another single penny for this war. Uh, that, that, it, it, that he should not get a, a, a single penny to, to spend on, on killing people anymore. Uh, what do you think of these ideas? Um, your first um, idea that you expressed that some people are uh, talking about not paying any taxes is not something I support. Uh, this is a big, complicated country uh, with a lot of services, and we protect people in many, many ways. Uh, we're not doing as good a job as we should do in food inspections, and I'm not happy about that. And I'm not happy about um, our trade relationship with uh, China at this point and some of the defective products they're sending us. But just think, your meat is inspected, uh, your water is clean, uh, all kinds of services that are paid for by our taxes. And we should not talk about just not paying taxes because we disagree with this president. But the members of Congress should not give the president another dime for this war. The members of Congress um, should not uh, relate to his request for $200 billion extra dollars. We should continue to put legislation on his desk, even if he vetoes it. But I am one who is not willing to give him another dime to continue this war, and I espouse that all the time. Ohio has been hard hit by a great deal of foreclosures brought on by predatory lending. You've been particularly articulate and strong about these issues, including your own Waters Amendment on financial institutions. I was wondering what you believe the prospects are of any kind of relief for housing consumers. Uh, here in Ohio, 80,000 people are going to lose their home. Here in Cuyahoga County, the number is close to 20,000 people who are going to be losing their homes. It's uh, an avalanche of foreclosures and uh, a serious problem in terms of adding to homelessness in this county, Cuyahoga County, in the state of Ohio. You're absolutely correct, and I'm so ashamed uh, that government failed uh, to be on top of this issue. Our regulators uh, seem to have been caught unaware of what was going on uh, in this country with all of the exotic products that were being offered by financial institutions. Uh, we had everything from um, no interest loans to loans that would reset uh, in six months, one year, two years, and quadruple the uh, amount of the mortgage that the homeowner would have to pay. We had no doc loans that I would like to outlaw altogether. Those are loans where you have no documentation of the person's ability to pay. And um, our um, loan initiators uh, and many of our uh, financial institutions uh, began to package these loans, as you know, and securitize them and sold them off uh, on Wall Street. Uh, they were sold in what is known as trounches, um, so that you know, you had some really, really bad ones in this trounch, a little bit better ones in this trounch, and a little bit better ones in this trounch. But the uh, investors uh, got so caught up in this and were making so much money at one point until they were buying up everything. Now you cannot even trace these loans, who originated the loans. As a matter of fact, um, what we are, having, we are holding hearings, uh, and what we are trying to do is to get those people who held the paper, like uh, Countrywide and some of the institutions that held the paper, they didn't necessarily sell it off, uh, to do workouts so that you can reconfigure these loans. So that if you had one of these loans that you were encouraged to get into one of these arms that's going to reset, and you know that you cannot make those payments, that you come back and you try and work out and get a 30-year fixed, or some kind of loan where the uh, monthly payments will be substantially less and you will be able to afford that. 
Uh, we also believe that the services of these loans, uh, this is this middle industry, uh, once uh, the investors have bought up these loans, the services now are basically contracted with uh, to take care of the loans. That means that they're collecting the payments, they're sending out the late statements, they're foreclosing. We believe that the services should have more ability to rework the loans so that those loans that you cannot connect back to the initiating institution still can be reworked by that uh, servicer or that agency that's responsible for the servicing. Um, we're looking at all of these things. Some of the institutions, like Countrywide, and I think as of today, maybe CityCorp and some of the others, have come up with ways to work with some of the con nonprofit consumer organizations uh, to assist people in helping them to rearrange these loans. And I'm going to take a close look at Countrywide. I'm having a hearing in Los Angeles this coming Friday to find out exactly what they've done, whether it's real or whether it's smoke and mirrors, to make sure uh, that it is real help rather than some attempt to just get the heat off of them. Now, having said all of that, uh, with the mess that we're in, and Ohio is in a very difficult situation with so many foreclosures, probably being you know, high up uh, in the country in foreclosures, maybe number two, one or two or so, um, I know that it has created a lot of problems uh, in these neighborhoods. Not only are people losing their homes, but when homes are boarded up and people are not staying in them, uh, they become, you know, just um, not only an eyesore, but a real problem. Sometimes, you know, uh, people will go into them, gang members will occupy them, and it just brings down the neighborhood and the property adjacent uh, uh, to these homes. So in addition to forcing workouts and making sure that these financial institutions, we're going to get Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac involved, we really have to do something about predatory lending. Now, it's very interesting, and I'll, I won't say a lot more about this. We have worked for years to open up opportunities for people who were redlined. There was a time when the financial institutions would simply redline whole communities and they wouldn't even go in there. And we have worked very, very hard to get Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and uh, all kinds of arrangements so that financial institutions, CRA credits, for example, uh, financial institutions would stop the redlining and make opportunities available to people based on their ability to pay. What happened in, with this disaster that we have, they didn't care whether or not people had the ability to pay. Some of them even falsified the loans just to get them through because they know they could sell them off after they bundled them. What we now have to do, despite the fact that we have some of the people representing these institutions saying, well, we bent over backwards to give people loans who otherwise could not afford them. Now look what has happened to us. No, that's not what we intended at all. We have never intended, never asked, and never supported the idea that you should put people in homes that they cannot afford because we know they're going to lose them. We ask that you do due diligence. You must do your due diligence so that you are matching up people with opportunities. We're now going to support a lot of funding and support for counseling and educating people about um, mortgages and, and how to buy a home. But we also have to find a way uh, to get rid of certain practices in the financial institution's world on prepayment penalties and other kinds of things that are causing people uh, to lose their homes. We also have information that shows that uh, many of these mortgages, people were charged too high an interest rate in many of the poor communities, and people who had good credit backgrounds that were comparable to credit backgrounds in other communities were given high cost loans with high cost interest rate even though they should have been in the prime market rate. So we have a lot of fixing to do. The financial services communities, community is very, very powerful in Congress. I mean very powerful. The financial institutions put a lot of money into politics and into politicians. And it's very, very difficult. They put their lobby to work. And when they put their lobbies to work, uh, they spend a lot of time on members. 
uh, and they have all of this influence. We've got to break that influence of the financial institutions so that we can get rid of the notion that you can make money off of poor people and people who cannot afford to be in these mortgages and you can charge any old thing that you want to charge without any repercussions. And so it is a commitment of mine before I leave Congress to go after the financial institution. If you're in the audience today, no financial institutions that 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 we believe in business in America and it is all right to be in business and to earn a profit we are not against earning a profit but we have seen the gouging the exploitation and the taking advantage of too many people who simply want to live the American dream and own a house and it's got to stop Uh, Congresswoman Waters, I've been reading about um, the war a lot myself, and some articles that I have read said that um, one reason that the United States went into the war was to privatize Saddam's oil and to ensure that America would have oil well into the future, that uh, Saddam had been uh, talking about trading his oil in euro dollars. And in fact, that was in the news last week about China doing the same thing. So my question to you is, is there uh, any truth in that? And if that is true, um, wouldn't that be the reason that, even though I agree with bringing the troops home, but the reason that the administration is uh, bent on staying over there to privatize those oil fields and to ensure America's oil for the future? I think I heard uh, your question. Some of it I missed, but let me just say this because I think this will answer it. Um, following 9-11, uh, you know, Americans were really traumatized. We were attacked uh, right here in the homeland. Uh, when those uh, two towers were uh, hit by those airplanes and that plane went down in the fields of uh, Pennsylvania and uh, the Pentagon was hit, uh, we were prepared to do whatever was necessary in order to secure the homeland and to get the perpetrators. And when the president first came to the Congress of the United States uh, with legislation that would give him permission to go after uh, the responsible parties, everybody supported except one woman who had better sense than all of us. Uh, that was Barbara Lee in Oakland, who even though he had to come back uh, to get um, permission to go to war, uh, she thought even at that early stage when we were talking about um, uh, when the president asked us for permission uh, to go after the perpetrators that we should be careful because she thought this would give him the opportunity uh, to go to war uh, and to do whatever he thought was necessary in order to protect the homeland. Well, uh, by the time he came back to ask for uh, war powers, uh, some of us disagreed with him and we would not support it, but not enough because people were still traumatized by what had happened. Uh, and if you can recall, uh, you might have heard a lot of talk about the idea that the neocons that, you know, in power, the Cheneys and the Rumsfelds and the Condoleezza Rices and others, had uh, basically been talking about uh, attacking Iraq because it was an easy target. He was basically toothless. After he invaded Kuwait, uh, we attacked him. We had about stripped him of all of his uh, serious weapons. And there was not a real belief by those who really knew that he had weapons of mass destruction. And they had not been able to find the weapons of mass destruction. But the President of the United States now had uh, the uh, kind of um, support that he needed in the country because of the attacks. Uh, to go after him, even though they had been talking about it uh, prior to the attacks uh, of 9-11. And so they thought that it would be very easy to do, and it was easy to get in and to bomb Baghdad and to uh, basically kill uh, Saddam Hussein. I mean, that was done, but nothing changed. I mean, they killed Saddam Hussein. Uh, they went in and took over uh, the country. We're now occupying the country. and. Uh, uh, we are no more secure uh, today uh, than when we went in there. That's the reason that we were supposed to have been going in there. 
and um, we have destabilized uh, the entire Middle East. The president thought they had done the job. Remember, he rolled out on that battleship in that little phony suit um, and basically um, with the sign behind him, mission accomplished. And when he did that, the insurgents said, now let the war begin. And they have fought a war that our soldiers are not prepared to fight, have never been trained to fight. And these IDs that are blowing up our men and women and uh, causing uh, all of this pain uh, for, you know, not only our soldiers but American families um, is beyond what anybody ever dreamed would happen. Now, when you talk about why he went there, and, uh, and, and I am uh, alluding to information that said that they wanted to go in there to prove how tough and strong we are and that the president could become a powerful president based on save, saving us from terrorism and identifying uh, the face of terror with Saddam Hussein. We all know now that Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda uh, was responsible for those attacks. Osama bin Laden is still not, has, still has not been apprehended. Uh, Al-Qaeda has expanded um, and the insurgents have come in from uh, Syria and other places into Iraq. And while they think they have gotten them contained uh, in Iraq, they've only gone over to Pakistan to get Musharraf. Uh, and so um, this business of uh, making the world safer uh, is something that the president would like to have you believe. And I'm hopeful that he could. I'm very pleased that there's a summit going on in Washington, D.C., organized by Condoleezza Rice right now, where we've even got Syria involved. Now, I have to tell you, uh, we've got Israel, we've got Syria, we've got Saudi Arabia, and I don't know who else involved in the summit, but they've got to get uh, some people that they don't want to talk to. They've got to get Hamas and some people involved. Uh, we'll never stop what is going on in the Middle East. And that's hard for people to digest and take. So having said all of that, we are occupying Iraq. We promised the, this country that we would get the proceeds from the oil uh, in Iraq, from the oil wells, and we would use that to reconstruct Iraq with that it would not cost the American taxpayers. None of that has happened. As a matter of fact, the insurgents have been blowing up the oil wells. We don't have any proceeds from them. The only person that's made any money in Iraq is Halliburton and Blackwater. Um, so Halliburton, the well-connected company with this administration that you will find not only in Iraq, but in New Orleans with no bid contracts, et cetera, seems to have made out all right. They cheated the American people. They've stolen our money, uh, and they're still there, and Blackwater, uh, is there not only so-called protecting in the green zone, uh, but they are um, killing Iraqis uh, without any worry uh, that they will be uh, charged for, for murdering uh, civilians. So I won't say any more because I could go on all night about this. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think we could easily go on all night in a lot of ways. Um, do you have one more for question there? What advice do you have for a young person that wants to go into the career of public services? As you heard the encouragement to women and girls here this evening, I would like to, in every way possible, encourage all of you to consider careers in public service. I perhaps did not say it, in the way that I should have said it, but your country needs you. Your country needs you very, very much. Um, I would encourage you, number one, to uh, complete your education, uh, to go to college, uh, to get degreed. I would encourage a lot of you to get degreed in international affairs and international relations. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we've got to understand how the world works. Uh, we really do. Um, it is so important to not only consider serving uh, in the United States government, for example, but my husband, uh, was an ambassador. Uh, he was an ambassador to a very lovely little country 
Uh, and um, he, um, he said it was, of course, the best position that he's ever had. And he never wanted it to end. But he was a political appointment under Mr. Clinton, and it had to end when Mr. Clinton ended. Um, but there are career service jobs in the State Department. And there are career service people who serve in any number of capacities, uh, working at the embassy and working in other countries all around the world. And it's extremely important uh, for us uh, to get interested and to learn about, because when we talk about peace, this is really what's going to help bring about peace, our knowledge uh, of the world. Uh, and how uh, these other countries operate. It is absolutely shameful how little we know and what we knew about the Middle East uh, when all of a sudden Saddam Hussein uh, was on the international um, agenda uh, and in invading Kuwait. Some people was hearing about him for the very first time. People cannot engage in the problems of the Middle East, and we'd better learn to engage in the problems of the Middle East because we have too many countries now with nuclear capability. And, uh, you know, I see proliferation rather than dismantlement. Uh, right now, I'm very worried about what's going on in Pakistan. Uh, even though it's internal, it could spill over. And Pakistan has nuclear capability. So does India, so does China, so does Israel, so does uh, any number of other countries. That's too much. Uh, and we should be concerned that uh, no country should need to have nuclear uh, capability. And you, in your careers, not only could help serve, but could help educate and provide a new kind of leadership. We're not the biggest, baddest gun on earth anymore. We have China who's holding a significant part of our debt. We have world trade that we're involved in and the WTO that most people don't even understand uh, what is going on and many of our smaller countries that are literally being stepped on uh, and their products are being, um, they're not able to take care of their people. We, I, I, you know, this, go, this is even in the Caribbean where we've tried to save the banana trade for the Eastern Caribbean and getting wiped out by uh, Chiquita bananas and the WTO. So we've got, to, we've got to learn what is going on in the world so that we can help save the world and help save the earth. We haven't even talked about uh, global warming. We haven't talked about the environment and some of these other things, but you, you can make the difference in whether or not the planet survives. Politics and public policy are very tough games. They are also very important games. In order to do well in them, to participate in them, to contribute in them, you need three things. You need passion to fight through all the disappointments. You need hope to see that you will accomplish something after all the disappointments. You need judgment to understand other people and the problems you have to work with. Congresswoman Maxine Waters is a great example of all three, and I thank her very much for coming.